Good evening. I'm Michael Ignatieff, Rector and President of CEU. I want to welcome everybody from the Budapest community. Uh, our doors are always open. open. And uh, those of you who need to have a simultaneous translation into Hungarian, we have little things you can put on for those of you who would like to hear it in Hungarian. Um, let me say a few, few things briefly, and then we'll get uh, right on to the events you've all come for. Um, let me say a little word about the general uh, title of this series. It's called Reasons for Hope. Um, put the emphasis on reasons. Uh, universities are in the business of providing reasons uh, based in knowledge, based in fact, based in evidence. Um, so the reasons part of this is pretty important and speaks centrally to the mission of a university like ours. And hope means something a little more than hopefulness, a little more than Mr. Micawber, I think it was, saying something will turn up. Um, I don't think any of us can live our life without hopefulness, without a sense that um, the future might be better for us than yesterday. But I think the hope we're talking about clearly is political hope, <clears throat> not in a partisan sense of the word, but a sense of hope or the collective communities that we care about, whatever they are. A sense that we were looking in this series for reasons, rational grounds, to invest in hope in the political communities we care about and use the knowledge, the reason, the argument that universities stand for to think about how we can make those political communities better. I mean, that's kind of what the idea is here. And one of the places where we need to do a lot of thinking relates to identity. Identity in the sense of who we are. The identities that we bring into this room, the identities of race, the identities of color, the identities of nation, the identities of gender, the identities of sexual orientation. These things matter intensely to us we also know they're historical, they're deeply shaped. The identities we had 50 years ago for that old are not exactly the identities we have now. The identities we will have in a generation might be very different. We know that identity is the source of an enormous amount of political mobilization in the sense that what is it that makes you angry enough, enraged enough, inspired enough to go out in the street or write a letter or join a movement, it often relates to issues of identity. A sense that your identity has been shamed, a sense that your identity has been humiliated, a sense that enough is enough, you want to stand up for your people. That way in which identity has been a tremendously important mobilizer of political hope. At the same time, as we all know, identity is a tremendous divider. Um, it becomes the basis of a politics of us against them. It becomes the basis of a fragmentation of political allegiance that makes it impossible for people who have different identities to work together for common goals. So in this sense, thinking about identity, both as a source of mobilization, both as a source of things that bring us together to strive for a better world, and also for the sense of the ways in which identity divides us, Identity is something we have to talk about, and if we're going to talk about identity, I think without any exaggeration, um, we've got the right guy in the room. Uh, Antony Appiah is uh, an enormously distinguished philosopher, uh, public intellectual, uh, professor of philosophy and law at New York University, um, Rockefeller University professor emeritus at Princeton, um, a man who's 
won a National Humanities Award from the President of the United States uh, and a lot of other prizes besides. But on the issue of identity, he's written the books that I think, and I say this particularly to students, these are the books you really want to read if you really want to understand your identity and the problem of identity as a political question. I'm speaking of The Ethics of Identity that he wrote in 2005, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, written in 2006, a wonderful book called The Honor Code, written in 2010, and a book that um, was built out of the BBC Wreath Lectures. Those of you who know the Wreath Lectures are one of the most important exercise of public advocacy that any intellectual gets to give, and he gave the BBC Wreath Lectures. And out of that, those lectures wrote a wonderful book called The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity 2016. And he's gonna to talk to us tonight about Beyond Identity, and I want CU to give Anthony Appiah a very, very warm CU welcome. Um, thanks for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming. A brown-skinned man gets into a cab in a European city and talks with a vaguely British accent. That would be me. If the driver is brown-skinned too, he's often trying, I suspect, to see if we have some sort of affinity. In the last few months, a Sikh and an Egyptian driver in New York City have asked me where I was born. So I said, in London, knowing that that really wasn't what they had in mind, and I told them that, knowing that it wasn't what they wanted to know, because what they meant to ask was where my people came from. Well, I come from two families in two places, pretty much pretty far apart. Uh, by the time I was born, my mother had lived in London off and on since her childhood. But her real home was far away in atmosphere, if not in distance, on the edge of the Cotswold Hills, where she had grown up on a farm in a tiny and absurdly picturesque village <laughs> on the border of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. After the Second World War, she found a job in London in an organization that was working, this was its project, for racial harmony in Britain. It, and it was called Racial Unity. And that was how she met my father, who was a law student from the Gold Coast, and an anti-colonial activist, the president of the West African Students' Union in London, and a representative of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who was to lead Ghana to independence in 1957, just a few years after I was born. So you could say she practiced what she preached. The other side of my family then came from Ghana, more precisely from Asante, a region in the heart of the modern Republic of Ghana, where he was born in Kumasi, its capital. My father's lineage could be traced back to an 18th century general, a successful member of the military aristocracy that created the Asante Empire, and his name is one of the names that my, ancestors, my parents gave me. This is an, an early 19th century Durbar in Kumasi, my hometown. So the book I wrote, The Lies That Mind Rethinking Identity, is full of family stories like these, not just my own, because I wanted to explore the ways in which narratives like these shape our sense of who we are. Each person's sense of self is bound to be shaped by a, by a background, but six of the chapters of my book are each focused on widely shared identities, gender, creed, country, color, class, and culture. Why do these matter, and what on earth do they have in common? My own thinking about these issues has led me over the years to an answer that guides me in the explorations that follow. So I began my explorations many years ago in the early 80s thinking about race. But when I turned to thinking about nationality and class and culture and religion as sources of identity and added in gender and sexual orientation, I began to see three ways in which these very disparate forms of grouping of people do have some, thing, some things, important things in common. The first is obvious, every identity comes with labels, so understanding identities requires first that you have some idea about how to apply them. That way, you could look for someone of that identity or try to decide of someone you'd met whether the label applied. Not everybody agrees about the boundaries here, very often, 
can a Muslim really be French? But there's usually some consensus about central cases. A second point is that membership in an identity group matters for its members' emotions and their deeds, and this is one of the ways in which um, they're, they're important for political mobilization. Um, identities create what you can call norms of identification, rules about how you should behave given your identity. And one of the commonest ways in which uh, they matter is that they, people feel some sort of solidarity with other people who bear the label, with other members of the group. So their common identity gives them reason, they think, to care about and to help one another. But just as there's usually conflict or contest about the boundaries of the group, about who's in and who's out, there's almost always disagreement about what normative significance an identity has. What does being Hungarian require of you? I doubt we could generate an easy consensus on that, even in a room full of extremely smart Hungarians. There's a third feature all identities share. Not only does your identity give you reason to do things, it gives other people reason to do things to you. I've already mentioned something that identity can make people do to you. It can make them treat you nicely because you're one of them. But among the most significant things that people do with identities, unfortunately, is that they use them as the basis of hierarchies of status and respect and structures of power. And in many places in one world, one ethnic or racial group regards its members as superior to the others and assumes the right to better treatment by everybody, including the state. In some, then, identities come first with labels and ideas about why and to whom they should be applied. Second, identities shape your thoughts about how you should behave and feel. And third, they affect the way that other people treat you. And finally, all these dimensions of identity are contestable, always up for dispute. Who's in, what they're like, what they should be like, how they should behave, and so on. And this little theory of identity, encapsulated in that tiny paragraph, has guided me, as I said, uh, in, the, in the sort of work that I've been doing over the years more recently about um, identity. Now, I'll turn in a moment to the longest discussion I want to do today, which is a discussion of, of class as a, as a form of identity, which I think is a, a, an unfortunately neglected topic, at least where I live. But first, let me say something about uh, a kind of identity I didn't discuss in the book, which namely what you might call political identities. Uh, last summer, the Washington Post published a picture of two men at a Donald Trump rally whose matching T-shirts read, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. It was definitely something that spoke to our moment. The Republican brand used to be proudly anti-Russian. In the Trump era, though, you can be a Republican Russophile for whom Putin is a defender of conservative values. American politics, it has become plain, is driven less by ideological commitments than by these partisan identities, less by what people think than in some sense by what they are. So identity precedes anything you could call ideology here. Now, political scientists um, would just say, I told you so, because they've been busily investigating uh, these tribal tendencies for a long while. As Jim Gimple of the University of Maryland once put it, party identification is not opinion, it's identity. And the same goes actually for ideological uh, identification in the United States, that is conservative versus liberal. In research that was published earlier uh, last year, um, Gimple's colleague Liliana Mason conducted a national survey that determined where people stood on various hot button issues, same sex marriage, abortion, gun control, immigration, healthcare, and the deficit. Then they were asked about how they felt about spending time with liberals if they were conservatives or conservatives if they were liberals about becoming friends with one, about marrying one. People's ideological animus, that is the animus against people of the other identity, the study found, wasn't best predicted by their opinions or even by how strongly they held them. It was best predicted by which label people embraced, whether they called themselves conservative or liberal. And Mason calls this identity-based ideology as opposed to issue-based ideology, but really what that means is it isn't ideology at all. And other researchers in political psychology prefer to speak of what they call effective polarization. All of these are polite ways of saying that political cleavages are not so much a matter of I disagree with your views as I hate your stupid face. 
You can be an ideologue without ideology. Experiments suggest, indeed, that partisan in-group preferences are extremely powerful in the United States today. Americans are, in fact, more polarized by party than by race. Indeed, while few Americans are still bothered by interracial marriage, recent surveys find that between 30 and 60 percent of people who identify as Democrats or as Republicans want their kids to marry in the party. They do not want their kids to marry someone of the other party. Those are the sort of numbers you would have had for interracial marriage in the middle of the 20th century in the American South. So that's, of course, a feature of people more than politics. Uh, long before anyone instructs children to group people into categories, they are programmed to do it anyway. And one of our basic ways of making sense of the world is to form generalizations of the sort that linguists call generics, generalizations like uh, tick bites give you Lyme disease. These generalizations qualify as true, though it turns out for the philosophers in the room to be extremely hard to say why, to give truth conditions for generics. Less than 2% of ticks, for example, transmit the Lyme uh, spirochete. So why is it true that we can say that uh, tick bites give you Lyme disease if only 2% of, uh, of the ticks have it? But anyway, that seems like the right thing to say, uh, even once you know that it's only 2% of them. But as the philosopher Sarah Lane Jane Leslie has argued, we're more likely to accept these generic claims if the property it mentions involves a reason for concern, like getting Lyme disease. What's more, generics encourage us to think of the class in question as a kind, as a group with a shared essence. To see how this works, Leslie joined with a couple of other psychologists and designed an experiment in which four-year-olds were shown pictures of a fictional kind of creature they called a zarpy. The people in the pictures were male and female, black, white, Latino, Asian, young and old. With one group of four-year-olds, so we're talking about very young children here, the experimenters made lots of generic remarks. Zarpies are scared of ladybugs, they said, for example. With another group, they avoided generics. Look at this zarpy. He's afraid of ladybugs. A couple of days later, they showed the kids a new zarpy and said that he made a buzzing sound. It turned out that the kids who'd heard a lot of generics about zarpies were much more likely to believe that all zarpies made buzzing sounds. So generic talk encouraged them to think of zarpies as a kind. We not only belong to groups like these, we're not only super prone to put people into groups like these, but we're also easily triggered to take arms against other groups once we form them. Evolutionary psychologists think these dispositions helped our ancestors survive by creating groups that could rely on to deal with the perils of prehistoric life, including other groups competing for resources. But those us and them instincts remain an indelible part of human nature. So take another look at those t-shirts. It's easy to assume that the great majority of Republicans who now support Trump are drawn to his admittedly noxious views, and easy to forget that among candidates who led in the Republican primaries, his percentage of the vote was the lowest in nearly half a century. Tribes come to rally behind their leaders, and partisan identification wouldn't be so stable if we didn't allow for a great deal of ideological flexibility. That's why rank and file Republicans could go from we need to stand up to Putin to why wouldn't we want to get along with Putin in the time it takes to say Trump's in, Rubio is out? So what can we do to take advantage of our tribes without succumbing to the debilitating effects of tribalism? Well, for the citizens of every divided nation, one of their identities is the national identity. And the theory of democracy is that we, the people, all of us, are charged with directing the ship of state together. Democracy isn't about majorities winning and minorities losing, parche almost everybody. It's supposed to be a system in which each of us takes responsibility for contributing to the collective welfare of the nation, of us all. And as John Rawls argued, we need to recognize that our fellow citizens with their differing conceptions of the good must nevertheless treat each other as free and equal persons and offer terms of social cooperation that all of us can endorse. A democratic compact requires us to secure for everyone, not just for our own tribe, the rights enunciated in the Universal Declaration, freedoms of speech and religion and assembly, the right to petition the government, equal protection of the laws, regardless of race, and so on. 
If you think, as those guys in their t-shirts pretended to, that you'd rather abandon the nation than allow it to achieve some of the aims of the other tribe, you're not in the democratic compact at all. And I'm actually pretty confident that those guys are, in fact, still in the compact, despite their t-shirts. In pretending to reject the compact with those t-shirts, they only succeeded in reminding us of it. They care about America, and thus about Americans, even when they affect to despise so many of them. So what can we do to stick to the compact while caring for our own tribes and their common projects? Social psychology teaches us that bigotry towards members of one's own community is something that can be both created and destroyed by the circumstances in which people live together. Long ago, the psychologist Gordon Allport argued for what's known as the contact hypothesis, and um, it takes a chapter to state the contact hypothesis, but roughly it said that contact between individuals of different groups makes hostility and prejudice less likely if it occurs in a framework that meets a few important conditions. Crucially, it must be on terms of rough equality, and it must be in activities where shared goals are pursued in contexts of mutual dependency. This is one reason why, for example, the United States racially integrated armed services turns out to produce people who are less racist on average when they leave than when they arrive. Now, the fact that the contact hypothesis works is what makes the segregation of communities within a single society potentially so dangerous, because segregation makes it unlikely that children will meet and collaborate, acquiring the experience of mutual reliance on terms of rough equality. We can do something about this in principle within the nation by segregating our communities and our schools by desegregating our communities and our schools. Uh, the, the United States is a long way from uh, even trying to do that in most places at the moment. And uh, some of us in the United States are used to thinking that we ought to do this to face the challenges of our racial divisions, that we ought to make our society less geographically segregated. But our political tribes are increasingly segregated too. If you, the, the, there's, there's been a, a, what one political scientist calls a great sorting, and people are moved to neighborhoods and communities which, uh, uh, which uh, map their political identities, and also they switch their political identities when they move to communities that they think of as having those, uh, those uh, political um, affiliations. So uh, we need to find, in the United States, and I want you to think about whether this is true of Hungary, uh, places where our dominant political tribes build the social trust that allows tribes to cohabit effectively in democracies while continuing to disagree about important matters. Here's a small fictional story that exemplifies the sort of thing I have in mind. It comes from a British television series, Skins, I don't know if any of you have seen it, which is about a group of students in England, high school students. And there's a scene in a birthday party of one of the characters, Anwar, who's an English teenager of South Asian ancestry, whose father is a devout Muslim. His best friend, Maxi, is a gay man. And he's been waiting for Anwar to tell his parents this, and Anwar has been afraid, perhaps predictably, to do so. Um, uh, um, Anwar himself is not gay. So Maxi is standing outside, refusing to come into the party, the birthday party, until Anwar does tell his father the truth. And while they're talking, Anwar's father comes out and invites Maxi in and says, what are you doing out here? My wife made that special curry you, you like. Come in, you, you know, what are you doing out here? And as he's talking to the young man, Anwar in the background finally said, says, Dad, Maxi's gay. And his father ignores him. So then Maxi himself says, I'm gay, Mr. Corral, I always have been. And there's this long silence, and Anwar and all of us wait anxiously to see what Mr. Corral is going to say. And here's what he says. It's a stupid, messed up world. I've got my God. He speaks to me every day. Some things I just can't work out. So I leave them be okay, even if I think they're wrong. Because I know one day he'll let me understand. I've got that trust. It's called belief. I'm a lucky man. Right? Come, Maxie. The food is ready. This is how people are with people that they are in regular cohabitation and conversation with. Mr. Corral belongs to the Muslim tribe. Maxi's tribe is Christian or post-Christian. But they do not have to agree about this very important matter. They have only to accept each other 
And they can do that without a theory or a principle because being together has generated commitments that can transcend even serious disagreement. That kind of what I'd like to call cosmopolitan cohabitation is something we all know how to do, but we're only going to bother to take this step if we're already in conversation with people. And that means sharing our thoughts about the things we agree about and about the things we disagree about. It means talking about big things and small things. Football, maybe some of you don't think football is a small thing, but um, television shows, maybe some of you don't think those are a small thing either, or movies, but uh, gossip about other people on the job. That I hope you all think is a small thing, but it's the sort of thing that people who are in conversation with one another talk about. So I think Mr. Corral, the, the fictional character, the fictional British Muslim, begins in exactly the right place with the admission that he can't work out everything, that the world is hard to understand, and he may not be right about everything. He doesn't abandon his belief that homosexuality is wrong. He lays it aside as something to be worked on later. Right now, what matters is celebrating his son's 17th birthday with his son's best friend. That works in practice. It does not need a theory. I'm a philosopher. I like theories. But theory isn't the only thing that matters. To accept the ways in which all politics is identity politics is to recognize that high-flown ideas, including a moral commitment to equality, say, don't matter until they come down to earth. Right now in the United States, we need ways to draw on our nonpartisan identities as Americans, as citizens of particular communities, members of churches and synagogues and mosques, to combat the tribalism that is undermining our democracy. For better or worse, it is only through identities that ideas can change the world. Maybe someone should put that on a t-shirt. Let me turn then, finally, as promised, to a discussion of one venerable identity that has often been central in modern politics, namely social class. In contemporary societies, pretty much everyone is against, of course, the old ways of allocating status through birth. We think that jobs should go not to people who have connections, but to the best qualified, regardless of class, or for that matter, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and a whole host of other supposedly irrelevant identities. Our response to the challenges of class then has been to endorse the idea that goes by the name of meritocracy. But the word meritocracy was invented by someone who disapproved of meritocracy. His name was Michael Young, and in a 1958 book called The Rise of the Meritocracy, which is the first book in which that word occurs, this wasn't, um, he discusses, uh, he, he makes his arguments uh, for, uh, the, he makes a case, essentially, against meritocracy. Now, this isn't a sociological tract. It's actually a work of fiction. And it, what it purports to be is an analysis written in 2033, looking back at the development of class in British society in the period between the book time when it was published and, the time, and 2033. In the distant future, unlike the class society of the 1950s, Riches and rule are earned, not inherited. The new ruling class was determined by the formula IQ plus effort equals merit. Narrating from the perspective of that future, Michael Young's fictional alter ego draws conclusions from over a half century of fictional social experience. This is all in the future when he writes this. Today, we frankly recognize that democracy can be no more than an aspiration and have rule not so much by people, by the people, as by the cleverest people. Not an aristocracy of birth, not a plutocracy of wealth, but a true meritocracy of talent. As I say, this is the first published occurrence of the word meritocracy, and the book aimed to show what a society governed by this principle would look like. And Young argued that the results wouldn't be pretty. His dystopian vision is of a world in which, as wealth increasingly reflects the innate distribution of natural talent, and the wealthy increasingly marry one another, society sorts into two main classes in which everyone accepts that they have more or less what they deserve. This is an England in which the eminent know that success is a just reward for their own capacity, their own efforts. As for the lower classes, their situation is different. Today, all persons, however humble, know they have had every chance. They are tested again and again. If they have been labeled dunce repeatedly, 
they cannot any longer pretend. Their image of themselves is more nearly a true, unflattering reflection. The older class systems were sometimes called systems of caste. In one respect, the old classes were like the castes of India. You were born into a structure, in India an exceedingly complex structure, of status hierarchies. Occasionally, by some mixture of talent and effort and good fortune, you might rise through the ranks. Occasionally, through ineptitude or laziness or bad luck, you could fall. The great revolutions of the late 18th century in France and in North America began a long process of gradually replacing a hereditary ruling class. Napoleon may have reintroduced a monarchy, but he saw it as governed by the ideal of the carrière ouverte au talent, the career open to talents, without distinction of birth or fortune. But as Michael Young anticipated, this ideal was bound to conflict with a force in human life as inevitable and as compelling is the idea that some individuals are more deserving than others, and that is the desire of families to pass on advantages to their children. As he said, nearly all parents are going to try to gain unfair advantages for their children. And when you have inequalities of income, one thing people can do with extra money is to pursue the goal of giving their children unfair advantages. I need hardly say that there's nothing wrong with cherishing your children. Uh, I, but I do say it because sometimes people hear me say what I just said and think that I'm denying that. It's obvious that it's okay, morally speaking, to cherish your children. But a decent society governed by the ideal of merit would have to limit the extent to which this natural impulse permitted people to undermine the meritocratic ideal. If the economic rewards of social life depended not just on your individual talent and effort, but also on the financial and social inputs of your parents, you wouldn't be living by the formula that IQ plus effort equals merit. And Young's apprehensions about what was going to happen have proved entirely well-founded. American meritocracy, the Yale law professor Daniel Markovitz argues, quote, has thus become precisely what it what was intended to combat a mechanism for the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege across generations. To the extent that you can predict that disproportionately many of the children of the elite will, and disproportionately many of the children of the precariat will not, achieve a position in the top tier of wealth, power, and privilege, you have something too much like the intergenerational transmission of status that marks systems of caste. In Markovitz's view, quote, meritocracy now constitutes a modern-day aristocracy. One might even say, purpose-built for a world in which the greatest source of wealth is not land or factories, but human capital, the free labor of skilled workers. Well, Michael Young saw in advance that that was what was going to happen. <laughs> Writing at the start of the new millennium, uh, much later, he lamented that educational institutions had been enlisted into a newly calcifying form of social stratification. Quote, with an amazing battery of certificates and degrees at its disposal, education has put its seal of approval on a minority and its seal of disapproval on the many who fail to shine from the time they are relegated to the bottom streams at the age of seven or before. What should have been, this is me, mechanisms of mobility have become fortresses of privilege. Yet if a new dynastic system was taking shape, you might conclude that meritocracy has faltered because we aren't meritocratic enough. If talent is capitalized efficiently only in high tax brackets, you could conclude that we simply failed to achieve the meritocratic ideal. You would seek to push more uh, religiously, more rigorously for merit, making sure that every child has the educational advantages and is taught the social tricks that successful families now hoard for their children. So isn't that the right response? Not according to Michael Young. He saw, and I think this is the part of his writing that has been achieved less uh, uptake than the part that I just quoted, he saw that there would be a problem even if the top class didn't exploit its advantages to give children chances that were denied to others. The problem wasn't just with how the prizes of social life were distributed, though that was a problem, it was with the prizes themselves. A system of class filtered by meritocracy would, in his view, still be a system of class. It would involve a hierarchy of social respect, granting dignity to those at the top, 
but denying respect and self-respect to those who did not inherit the talents and the capacity for effort that combined with proper education would give them access to the most highly remunerated and respected professions, occupations. That's why the authors of his fictional Chelsea Manifesto, which in the rise of the meritocracy serves as the last sign of resistance to the new order, ask for a classless society. The classless society, but, but they have a specific understanding of what that means. The classless society would be one which both possessed <clears throat> and acted upon plural values. Were we to evaluate people not only according to their intelligence and their education, their occupation and their power, but according to their kindliness and their courage, their imagination and sensitivity, their sympathy and generosity, there could be no classes. Every human being would then have equal opportunity to develop his own special capacities for leading a rich life. Class, this is now me, class identities in a meritocracy reduce people to a single measure of wealth. Sorry, I should have put that up for you. Uh, reduce uh, people to a single measure of worth, the argument runs, and only someone with a very limited vision could suppose that human worth reduces to a single measure. And so the manifesto proposes an alternative vision in which we recognize many forms of excellence. This profound commitment to the social equality of all people, people with variety of talents, can sound quixotic, but I think it draws on a deep philosophical picture that I hope to persuade you is right. The central task of ethics is to ask, what is it for a human life to go well? The answer, I think, is that living well means meeting the challenge set by three things. Your capacities, the circumstances into which you were born, and the projects you yourself decide are important. Making a life, my friend, the philosopher and legal scholar uh, Ronald Walkin once wrote, is a performance that demands skill, and it is the most comprehensive and important challenge we each face. But because each of us becomes equipped with different talents and is born into different circumstances, and because people choose their own projects, each of us faces his or her own challenge, one that is, in the end, unique. So there isn't a sensible answer to the question whether one person meets her challenge better than another. Did Bertrand Russell have a better life than Mozart? The only sane answer is that Russell was a better philosopher and Mozart a better musician. I know what it is for my life to go better or worse, but it doesn't make sense to ask whether my life is better than yours. And that means that there isn't a comparative measure, there isn't a scale of human worth. As a result, a system of selection for jobs and educational opportunities cannot be designed by considering who is most worthy of those opportunities because, as Michael Young argued through his Chelsea Manifesto, there isn't a single scale of merit on which to rank people. Indeed, because each of us faces a distinct challenge, what matters in the end is not how we rank against others at all. Life isn't a competition. We do not need to find something we are best at. What is important is that we do our best. The ideal of democracy then, uh, of meritocracy then, confuses two different issues. One is a matter of efficiency. The other is a matter of human worth. If we want people to do difficult jobs that require talent, education, effort, training, and practice, we're going to need to be able to identify candidates with the right combination of talent and willingness to exert them and provide them incentives to train and practice. So we can design schools and universities and select people to fill the places in them. If the institutions are working properly, they aren't merely handling out credentials, which is a danger, they're building human capital. We then allow for entrepreneurship, social and commercial, and we offer jobs with salaries and other advantages, interesting work, respect and autonomy in your job, vacations, pensions, healthcare, and select people to fill them as well. We open careers in Napoleon's formulation to develop talent. But in the end, there will be a limited supply of educational and op uh, occupational opportunities, and so we'll have to have ways of allocating them. And in, as intelligent machines dominate more and more activities, that supply may grow more scarce. At school and work, we will have to use some principles of selection to match people to positions. Those principles should be designed so that the educational system produces a supply of people who have the right trainings, and the jobs end up being done by people who are prepared to do them. 
Of course, both the jobs and the schools must do more than make people useful to others. Work needs to have meaning. So it had better be doing something for the people who do it as well as for everybody else. Education needs to prepare you for life as a citizen, as a private person, as someone living this valuable human life, and not just as someone earning a living. Such considerations must be taken in account in selecting people for schools and colleges in the world of work. If these principles of selection have been reasonably designed, we can say, if we like, that the people who meet the criteria for entering the schools or getting the jobs merit those positions. That is, to, insist some useful, in, to enlist some useful philosopher's jargon, a matter of institutional desert. People deserve these positions in the sense in which people who buy winning lottery tickets deserve their winnings. They got them by a proper application of permissible rules. Institutional desert, however, has nothing to do with the intrinsic worth of the people who get into college or who get the jobs. Any more than lottery winners are people of special merit and will lottery losers are people who are somehow especially unworthy. Even if we are going to reward hard work, the capacity for hard work is itself the result of natural endowments and upbringing. So neither talent nor effort, the two things that would determine rewards in the world of the meritocracy, is itself something earned. Someone who, as the rise of the meritocracy bluntly put it, has been repeatedly labeled dunce, still has capacities and aptitudes and the challenge of making a meaningful life. The lives of the less successful are not less worthy then, but not because they are as worthy or more worthy. There's simply no sensible way of comparing the worth of human lives. Here, I think, is a better picture. Money and status are social rewards that can encourage people to do the things that need doing. It will be a matter of luck whether you inherit the capacities whose development will be rewarded in the society into which you are born, and of more luck whether the capacities you actually develop turn out to be highly rewarded. You can respond to messages from the market and seek training, of course, and a well-designed society will elicit and deploy developed ta talent efficiently. The English poet Thomas Gray, in his well-loved 1751 elegy written in a country churchyard, wrote about the talent wasted in a society that fails to train all its young Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Gray's society had not, of course, achieved universal education, let alone imagine the removal of barriers to success based purely on accidents of birth. So perhaps, he thought, below those gravestones he imagined, there rested some mute, inglorious Milton, or some Cromwell guiltless of his country's blood. Now, the vista of the country courtyard may tempt us to suppose that in the absence of penury and restraint, people offered adequate educations will find a level set by their natural talents. Each natural poet, the picture is, will find her in a Milton. Each tyrant is waiting in a Cromwell. What's missing here, though, is a sense of the massive contingency of human life. Not knowing who could be a Milton, we do not know which parents should immerse their children in the world's great ocean of poesy. To prepare the next Einstein, you'd need to know what talents it will take to make the next great breakthrough in physics. And if we knew that, we wouldn't need the next Einstein. However the dice may fall, people will inevitably want to share both money and status with those they love seeking to get their children financial and social rewards. Inheritance laws permit us to transfer money to our children. Class lets us transfer status through the educational system, enlarging their cultural capital, and permits us by sharing connections to enhance their social capital. But we shouldn't secure our children's advantages in a way that denies a decent life to the children of others. Each child should have access to a decent education, suitable to her talents and her choices as they both develop. Each should be able to regard him or herself with self-respect. Historically, we have used inheritance taxes to help even out opportunities. For some reason, this is out of fashion. Further democratizing the opportunities for advancement is something we know how to do then, even if the state of current politics in Britain and the United States makes it increasingly unlikely that it will actually be done. But maybe not. Maybe we'll see something new in the next cycle. 
But we also need to work to do something that we don't, I think, yet uh, quite know how to do, which is to eradicate contempt for those who are disfavored by this ethic of effortful competition. The goal isn't to eradicate hierarchy and to turn every mountain into a salt flat. We live in a plenitude of incommensurable hierarchies, and the circulation of social esteem will always advantage the better novelist, the more important mathematician, the savvier businessman, the faster runner, the more effective social entrepreneur. We can't fully control the distribution of economic, social, and human capital, or eradicate the intricate, and we certainly shouldn't try, or it, uh, because that would produce totalitarianism, or eradicate the intricate moire patterns that emerge from these overlaid grids. But class identities don't have to internalize the injuries of class. And I think it remains an urgent collective endeavor to revise the ways we think about human worth in the service of moral equality. Class labels, like all labels that mark our identities, belong to communities. They are a social possession. Over the course of my lifetime, I have watched, learned from, and participated in the reshaping of what it means to be women and men, and yes, sometimes neither, in the various interconnected places that I have lived my life. Without the reshaping of gender that has increasingly liberated us all from old patriarchal assumptions, I could not have lived my life as a gay man married to another man, making a life in public and private ways together. This life has been made possible through other people's struggle, in ways both large and small, and by my taking small risks with friends, employers, and family. Had I stayed in Ghana, I would, like other lesbians and gay Ghanaian, lesbian and gay Ghanaians, have a long road still to travel. But in the meanwhile, women in Asante, who were always more autonomous than in many other parts of the world, have seen their options grow and prosper, in part through the recognition that much that was once assumed impossible for women because of what <laughs> women essentially were, could be made possible, and that a world of empowered women is enriching for men as well. There's a liberal fantasy in which identities are merely chosen, so we're all free to be what we choose to be. But identities without demands would be useless to us. Identities work only because once they get their grip on us, they command us, speaking to us as an inner voice, and because others, seeing who they think we are, can call on us too. If you do not care for the shapes your identities have taken, you cannot simply refuse them. They are not yours alone. You have to work with others inside and outside the label group in order to reframe them so they fit you better. And you can do that collective work only if you recognize that the results must serve other people too. Identities can all become forms of confinement, of course, but they can also give contours to our freedom as working class and gay and lesbian and national and religious identities have done in struggles all around the world. Women have worked together across class and language and religion and nation in the global struggle against oppression and inequality. Social identities connect the small scale where we live our lives alongside our kith and kin with larger movements, causes, and concerns. They can make a wider world intelligible, alive, and urgent. They can expand our horizons to communities larger than the ones we personally inhabit. And we're denizens of an age in which our actions in the realm of ideology, as in the realm of technology and politics, increasingly have global effects. So when it comes to the compass of our concern and compassion, humanity as a whole is not too broad a horizon. We live with seven billion fellow humans on a small warming planet. The cosmopolitan impulse that draws on our common humanity is no longer a luxury, it's become a necessity. And in encapsulating that ancient ideal, let me end with the words of a freed slave from Roman Africa, a Latin interpreter of Greek comedies, a man from classical Europe who called himself Afer, the African. Here's how uh, Publius Terentius Afer, writing more than two millennia ago, put it. Homo sum humani nihil ame alienum puto. I am human. I think nothing human alien to me. That, I think, is an identity that can bind us all. Thank you. <laughs>